guys, welcome to the show. My name is Jerry Miller. I love Seville Show live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world. A lot to cover, a lot to cover, a lot to cover. So I'm going to give you the nitty gritty from yesterday. Yesterday's show was the response to Mayor Walker's Facebook Live on Sunday. The response from yesterday's show has been significant. I will let you know in part, not all, of what the response was to yesterday's show. So immediately after yesterday's show, I received an email from a burner email account. And this email from a burner email account had a number of attachments. Um, and it was clearly attachments that were from Charlottesville City Use. So I don't know who the email was from, who sent it to me. It was a made up handle, a made up name. But within this email, there were a handful of attachments. One of them I'm going to relay on air to you. Also, after yesterday's show, I hear from two media outlets, including the NBC29 station and the newspaper. We know the Daily Progress is working on a story now about this credit card usage, um, clearly illegal. And I think what the story is, we know for a fact that the credit card usage was illegal. The true story is what happens next. That's the story. So this is what I'm going to do. My background before launching this business in 2008, in 2008, I launched an advertising agency. Prior to 2008, I was a journalist. I was, uh, won multiple Virginia Press Awards. Um, the youngest editor in the Daily Progress history um, was hosting a syndicated radio show that was six days a week and two TV shows on NBC29, doing those three things and running a, a website where I was hosting the, the print, the TV, and the radio all on a website. 2008, 2008 I decided to go into business for myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to change hats and change perspectives here. And I'm going to go from entrepreneur, small business owner, talk show host who is looking to entertain, and I'm going to put that to a side, and then I'm going to put the hat on that is um, that of a journalist. And I've done that. I did that for eight years and change out of UVA. So here's, here's the questions you've got to ask if you're a journalist. Here are the questions you will see in the newspaper. Richmond Times dispatches on this story as well. Um, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, how much money was spent by Mayor Walker on these credit cards? Uh, how much money was spent by Mayor Walker on her city-issued credit card to purchase gift cards for private citizens? That's the first question we should all be asking. She said in the video on Facebook Live that she's been doing this since 2018. So she set the term of her transgressions or the term of the crime committed starting in 2018. What we don't know is the actual amount that was spent by the mayor of Charlottesville, Virginia on a credit card issued by Charlottesville government and city hall to purchase gift cards for private citizens. That's the first question we should ask ourselves. I was text messaging last night with Nolan Stout of the Daily Progress. Nolan has left for a job in Northern Virginia. If Nolan Stout was still covering the Charlottesville City beat at the newspaper today, this story would already be front page headlines. They don't have someone on the Charlottesville beat currently, so someone who's off the Charlottesville beat is now working on this story, and that's why we have not had a story in the newspaper yet, but it's coming. Aaron Richardson, the editor over there, is working on it with his team. So the first question the journalist that's putting this story together for the Daily Progress or the Richmond Times Dispatch or the Washington Post. The first question you should ask is this. How much money did the mayor of Charlottesville spend from 2018 until Sunday when she made this announcement on Facebook Live through a city-issued credit card um, for purchasing gift cards for private citizens? That's the first question. The second, why we have to get that total is because we have, um, we have a standard that's already been set. We have a history um, that's already been set. And those standards and histories involve Paige Rice, 
Sherry Ayacheta, and Stephanie Commander. Paige Rice got into trouble with the law over $766.98. I will repeat that. Paige Rice pled guilty to misdemeanor embezzlement over $766.98. Remember, she was the Charlottesville Clerk of Council, the Chief of Staff for Council. In July of 2019, she pled guilty to misdemeanor embezzlement because she basically kept an iPhone and an iWatch for an extended period of time after she was no longer employed by the city of Charlottesville. So $766.98 is one threshold. Sherry Ayacheta and Stephanie Commander they got popped by the law because they were setting up cell phones for Sherry's hubby and for Stephanie herself, and she was an electoral board member. She shouldn't have gotten one. There's another standard. The first question we have to ask is, how much was spent from 2018 to now on the city-issued credit card? The second question I'm asking as a journalist, I don't do this anymore. That's not what I do anymore. I, I was a journalist, won multiple Virginia Press Awards, the second question you have to ask yourself as a journalist is, if this, and this is a tough question to ask, but this is what journalists have to do. This is a really tough question I'm going to ask here, and you're going to see immediately why this is a tough question. If the illegal usage of the city credit card by Mayor Walker started in 2018, and it's been going on ever since, the next question you have to ask is, how did no one else know about this? And that's a really crappy question to ask. And why it's a really crappy question to ask is because if no one truly knew about the illegal use of the credit card, if no one truly knew that Mayor Walker was using this credit card illegally, then that shows the true level of incompetence, lack of communication, and dysfunction within City Hall. That being said, if someone knew that the mayor was using this credit card in this capacity illegally from 2018 to now, and those folks didn't mention this to people, the next question after that you have to ask is, do they have exposure, liability, or does any culpability fall on their desk or their position because it was not brought to people's attention that the mayor was using this incorrectly? To the mayor's credit, if in 2018 or 2019 someone tapped her on the shoulder and said, you can't use credit cards like this to buy gift cards for private citizens, she would have stopped to her credit. Now, ignorance is not an excuse, and ignorance does not mean you don't get popped by, the jo by Johnny Law. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. How much money was spent by the mayor illegally on the city-issued credit card? If this has been going on since 2018, how did no one in City Hall know about what the mayor was doing? The next question is, if people did know that the mayor was making illegal charges on her credit card, should those people have exposure, liability, and should they get in trouble? That's another question that's a fair one. Now, here's one of the documents that was sent to me. Judah, I'd like to get Charlottesville standard operating procedure for credit cards on screen if you could. Okay? Let's start with the first page, please. Let me know. That is on screen. Thank you, Judah Wickhauer. One of the documents that was sent to me, I received this document, in fact, from four different people. One of the email, one of the people that sent me this document sent it to me through a burner email along with another, another of other attachments. It was a weird email address at yahoo.com. So this document that you see on screen, why don't we go to page 11, if you could, of this document. Please, sir. Page 11, do you have that on screen? So page 11, and why this was emphasized to me by the burner email account that sent me this document, is page 11 shows that every employee who gets this card, this credit card, has to sign this document. And this document says, I, blank, sign your name, an employee of the Charlottesville, Virginia, acknowledge that I've been provided with the city of Charlottesville credit card on which I am authorized uh, signature. I understand that I'm, I, I am able to use this credit card in accordance with the city manager's credit card procedures. So when you get this document that was emailed to me from an illegal burner account, someone working at City Hall, this document that you signed, do we still have page 11 on screen? We do? If you could get back there. When you sign page 11, you acknowledge you've read this entire credit card procedure document. Go back to the first page if you could, J. Dobbs, and let me know when that's on screen. 
So the first page, the cover photo of the standard operating procedures for use of credit cards if you're a city employee, the cover page, the first page, the effective date, 12-20-2018. 12-20-2018. So the mayor has signed this document that outlines what you can do with credit cards. That is on file at City Hall. Now, on top of the questions I have, I think you need to hear from her, where she literally on Facebook Live is, is I'm, not a, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an attorney, I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, I did not watch ER on television, uh, I, I, I'm not watching Law and Order, I know some of Jack McCoy's tactics, but I only watch Law and Order in rerun form, I, I'm no attorney. But I'm going to play you a video clip from Sunday in her Facebook Live. This would be number one, Judah. Get that ready to play for us. You will see in number one here, a straight, I'm pretty sure this is a straight-up confession to a legal, a legal acts here in number one. Do you have that ready to go, clip one? You do? All right. Give that, listen closely. Listen closely, please. Play clip one in three, two, and one. So I get this email, so I go looking for this memo on the third. And it was this four page memo from the city attorney that talked about a counselor um, who was um, illegally using city funds. Now, before I go into any detail, you know, you don't have to be a reader of any time in history that um, you understand what plastering on the front page of any paper, but especially our daily regress, that there was an internal investigation. And I don't know how that investigation went because nobody interviewed me about um, me, because it said a counselor, but it was me, um, misusing funds. A conversation that by the time I had found out had been going on for two months and um, had already involved the prosecutor, Joe Platania, in deciding whether he would prosecute me. (sighs) That was after the whole city manager thing, which we're gonna get to in a second. Um, But what did I do? Speakers come and speak, typically about how to infuse equity in the conversation and I pay them. Community members come up with solutions that people who are making 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, $200,000 can't come up with, and I give them $25 gift cards for every hour that they spend and devote to um, helping us heal this community, right? Bringing the people in who can be a part of the solution um, instead of keep paying some of the same people who have perpetuated the current state that we're in. That's what I'm guilty of. Um, I've been doing that since 2018. All right. So, okay. So here's what we have. From my standpoint, that is clearly a confession on the record on camera in front of a hot microphone of illegal activity. I just played it for you. We have a precedent in Paige Rice and Sherry Ayesheta. Paige Rice, 766 bucks and 98 cents, an iPhone watch and an iPhone. The next question you got to ask if you're putting a, a centerpiece story together for the Sunday edition of The Daily Progress, something that's going to be above the fold. Um, something that's going to jump inside, something that'll have an infographic and perhaps a sidebar for the piece, for the package. If I'm Aaron Richardson, I'm, 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 I'm teasing the package with the teaser and the header above the fold, letting folks know that on Sunday, the centerpiece package is coming in the newspaper, and it's going to have a thorough analysis because they didn't get the news out first, so they th- now, as the newspaper of record, have to take the story in totality. 
as opposed to just having the news out first. So if I'm Aaron Richardson, the city editor, the next question I'm asking, the first one was A, how much money was spent by the mayor on illegal, credit, uh, illegal purchases with city credit cards? The, the second question is, if this started in 2018, how did no one know about this? The third question is, if people did know about this in City Hall, what happens to them from a culpability standpoint, a ramification standpoint? The fourth question is, what is Joe Plantania's role in this? And, and what makes this story even more dynamic is Joe Plantania, the Commonwealth's attorney for the city of Charlottesville, he's in an election year right now. So here we have a man who came on the show yesterday. Thank you for coming on the show, Joe. I thought I was very fair with the interview I did. You agreed with me. The man who came on the show yesterday is in an election year. So you're running for Commonwealth's attorney of Charlottesville, and you have to ask yourself this question. Michael Blevins, we'll reach out to you. Michael Blevins of uh, Vision Barbecue, we will reach out to you. He's going to join us on this show. Here's what you have to ask if you're Joe Plantania. I am in, election, in, in an election year. Do I pursue this case against the mayor of Charlottesville? This is a PR nightmare waiting to happen. I'm not sure how this case is going to play out and how it could impact my re-election bid for Commonwealth's attorney in the city of Charlottesville. So Joe Plantania in his office, they have a conundrum. By law, you have to pursue this case. From a PR nightmare standpoint in election year, maybe you consider don't doing it. Let's hear what Joe had to say on this very topic. Do you have Joe Plantania sound ready to go from yesterday, Judah? Can we have that sizzle reel? Uh, just a second. He joined us on yesterday's program. Michael Blevins, we're going to get to you in about 90 seconds on this show. Um, let me know when you have Joe Plantania ready to go, J-Dubs. It's a PR nightmare. It is a PR nightmare. The, the Commonwealth attorney, while running for a second term must choose whether or not to bring charges against the mayor of Charlottesville, Virginia. That is a PR nightmare. I asked this question of Joe. You got that ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Let's cue it up in three, two, and one. Um, I'll start open-ended, and I'm going to continue to be fair here. Um, your thoughts on what she's saying with using a city credit card to purchase gift cards for citizens? Well, I, I did watch the lead in, Jerry, and as a journalist, I appreciate the question. Uh, you're free to ask it. You've been very fair with me. But I'll answer globally as a prosecutor. We don't ever comment on the existence or the lack of existence of a criminal investigation. We get asked to look into stuff, and this is generally, this is not the situation that you referenced. We get asked because of the nature of what we do to look into stuff all the time and we're ethical and professional and responsible, and we don't comment on that because it's not fair to the people that may or may not be uh, investigated. So just in a very general sense, not to that specific situation, we, we wouldn't comment on that that's, as an office. That's fair. That's fair. That's completely fair. So it's not his first rodeo. Joe handled the question well. I knew he couldn't comment on it. We all know he couldn't comment on it. He still offered a little perspective here. So... The fourth question is, how does the Commonwealth's attorney handle this? The fifth question is, is the Commonwealth attorney influenced or impacted um, in choosing to pursue a case against the mayor of Charlottesville, Nakia Walker, because he's in, a, in an election year? Does an election year for Joe Plantania keep him from pursuing a case against mayor of Charlottesville, Nakia Walker, because of the potential PR nightmare that will come from it? The Joe Plantania I know pursues this case because the precedent that is Paige Rice. Now, I'm going to get to Mike Blevins. He's opening up a new restaurant next to the, next to the Shabin. I'm going to bring him on the line. But the topic I'm talking about now, I will continue after, the, after this interview with Michael Blevins, the newest owner of uh, Vision Barbecue next to the Shabin. Here are the questions that, that still have left to be asked and, uh, and still need to be answered. What can city council do now? We have the mayor of Charlottesville airing the dirtiest of laundry in a public forum. City council, Lloyd Snook, Heather Hill, Cena McGill, and Michael Payne, do they consider through a vote 
of asking to quote unquote muzzle the mayor and keep her from speaking anymore about airing dirty laundry. Second, do Payne, Snook, Hill, and McGill vote to strip Mayor Walker of her mayor title? Third, do Snook, McGill, Hill, and Payne, the four of them vote Mayor Walker off city council? I'll try to answer those questions after Michael Blevins. Michael Blevins is um, owner, might be a co-owner, of Vision Barbecue next to Shabin. We'll bring the Walker topic back up after this interview. Alex Erpi is also going to join us on today's program, the co-star of Today, E Manana, which airs tomorrow on the I Love Seville Network. Um, gentlemen, thank you kindly for joining us. You guys are live here across the show. Um, with many, many folks watching. First, introduce me to, to you guys. Who am I chatting with here? All right, I'm Mike Blevins, co-owner of Vision Barbecue. Gabby Barbecue, also co-owner. Okay, fantastic. Co-owners right here. Gentlemen, oh. give us your background in food and beverage. Uh, well, let's see, I'm a culinary school graduate. Um, graduated 12, 13 years ago. Uh, worked all over town. Um, in particular, worked at Maya for uh, around almost six years, uh, which is where uh, Mike and I kind of came up with the idea of Vision Barbecue. Um, we never had a name for it until recently, and um, just all, all the everything fell into place, and, and here we are now. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Mike? Uh, I had I was in and out of uh, Richmond restaurants in the '90s, and then I moved up here in 2001 and sold crap a dozen years. Um, I built a brewery down in Petersburg, and then I ended up having to uh, leave that project, and I worked at Maya for about six, seven years on and off, and here we are with Vision Barbecue. I love it. Um, small business owner myself, small <laughs> business owners, you guys. I respect the yeah. hustle and chutzpah, freaking hard as heck to run these small businesses. Let me ask you the million-dollar question that everybody has probably asked you right now, gentlemen. Why open a restaurant during a pandemic? <laughs> well, that's uh, maybe we're crazy. Who knows? <laughs> it, it's uh, we're you know we're, we always wanted to focus on uh, a takeout, walk up type of place. So um, what we have here in this space, uh, it's going to be probably ninety percent takeout, uh, third party delivery. We do have a few tables. But we are, we are concentrating on, um, you know, socially distanced takeout products. So it's basically almost like a walk-up <coughs> lunch counter type of place. So you walk in, you get your food, it'll only take a couple of minutes, and you walk right on out. What are you thinking? What are you thinking, Gabby? I mean, yeah, that's that's really what it is. We're, we're kind of treating it like a, uh, a large-scale food trailer, really. Um, We've got our smoker out in the parking lot, and we've got our, our plate up space in the back. We've got plenty of room back there, so we're really going to be able to just just knock the orders out. Uh, whether it's Grubhub or takeout, you walk in, you're you're looking at five minutes tops, and you're going to have a bag of food ready to go. I love it. You know, I love it. Yeah, yeah. a lot of it's focus on people, you know, staying in their seats and ordering more stuff. We want people in and out as fast as possible. Very nice. Um, Mike, I'm going to throw this to you. Vision Barbecue, you're located next to the Shabin. Two-part yes. two question. Um, the yep. idea behind the name Vision Barbecue, and the second part of the question is the space next to the Shabin. I love the pick that you guys made. It's centrally located. It's basically downtown. I think the moniker is actually Vinegar Hill, but it's basically downtown. Yep. you got freaking tremendous parking right in front of the space. You never have to worry about parking. It's close to everything. Um, I love the mm -hmm. spot you picked. So I guess two-part question. Tell us about the name Vision Barbecue, and then tell us about the space, why you picked that space. Well, Vision name, Barbecue's all him. I was, uh, honestly, I was hanging out at home watching old skateboard videos and, and, and got to thinking. I was like, you know, Vision Skateboards, a couple of dudes that had this idea. It's all DIY. They 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 did what they what they had to do to put themselves out there, and it just kind of clicked. It's like, you know, that's what we're trying to do got this 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 thought this vision of of how we should be selling food and it it you know it's just sort of a spur of the moment idea and um it, it really took off and uh so we're, we're sticking with it i love it i love it how about you mike the space 
the space. Well, we had been looking at uh, several different places around town, and uh, you know, of course, the the cost is a was definitely at the forefront. So, you know, we we looked at a few spots. You know, we um, pretty seriously, and um, you know, I've known Walter since he opened the Shabin, and uh, Gabby's known him for a long time, and. This space was coming up, and he mentioned something to us, and uh, it made a lot of sense. It's like you said, it's got a parking lot. It's really centrally located. There's lots of construction all around, uh, you know. And uh, I think a good part of our business is probably going to be walk-up uh, construction workers, and you know, I, I, it's a great spot. Vision Barbecue next to the Shabine. These two guys got some heart. They got some chutzpah. And they got some hustle, um, fellas. What can we expect um, when you're up and running? tip-top shape um, I want to come for lunch or dinner I want to wet the whistle I like to wet the whistle what can we expect from vision barbecue uh, with a, a, a scaled back version of our menu for the first week or two uh, we'll always have uh, pulled pork smoked chicken and brisket <clears throat> um, for sides we'll have baked beans mac and cheese coleslaw pretty standard barbecue shop fare. Uh, and then as we get busier, as we get a feel for what our customers are interested in, we'll, we'll do some specials. We'll throw some burn-ins out there, maybe some spare ribs. Um, we, you know, we've got some ideas, but we're, we're just trying to keep it tight for right now. Uh, we don't have beer yet. We're hoping that one day we might be able to sell beer. Right now we're uh, Pepsi products. Um, but, you know, again, geared up more for uh, just a quick in and out. We do have a couple of seats out on the patio uh, for people that want to you know, hang out and enjoy a nice day. Um, and then we'll, we've, we've got about 10 seats inside. Nice. If you want to. Uh, Very nice. And then I think the community we'll is going to rally around you guys. I think with your your history in restaurants, I think the community is going to rally around you. I think the community likes to try new things. I think you're coming. You're doing this in your opening at. I, it's crazy to say this, but I think at a good time, I think by March, I think the vaccine is going to be at the CVS stores. I think we could have potentially demand with the vaccine starting to be met in March and April. I mean, you guys, I started my business in 2008 in a recession. And in and, and retrospect, it was the best time to ever start a business because if I can make it then, I can make it in good times. I mean, why don't I throw that yeah. to you, Mike, and why don't we close on that? The perspective of like, if you can make it now, you can make it in good times. That it's just about creating, serving really, really good food that that makes people feel happy and getting them to come back again. Absolutely. So it's always about what you just said. It's always about having that good food that the people can depend upon. They know they can come in here. They can get takeout in under ten minutes. Um, but with us, you know, it, it was really just the big pivot during COVID to a different model uh, you know the you really got to see exactly how much people would embrace takeout and it's not going to go away so you know the the vaccine's not going to come along and everything's going to be cleared up by summer and people aren't wearing masks that would be great if that happens but people are still going to order takeout at a higher rate than they did before um, and, and that's really what we wanted to embrace and I, I think that's it's a really exciting new part of the restaurant industry well said we wish you luck we will be there when's the grand opening friday it is friday. Yeah. friday dude have you guys been sleeping uh, <laughs> it's about to change <laughs> congratulations yeah. thank you thank you Thanks, so we we've uh We've been kind of low key about this whole thing and kind of snuck it in there. So, um, yeah, Friday, Friday will be open at 11 o'clock. We wish you the best of luck. We'll be there this weekend. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on the show. Vision Barbecue next to Shabine, grand opening this Friday. Approachable, delicious barbecue at fair prices by these gentlemen. Thank you kindly for joining us on the show, fellas. Right. Thank you so much. Media. We'll get you on social media. You guys have a good one. Um, thank you for coming on, on the program, guys. The newest restaurant to open in Charlottesville, Virginia, opens on Friday next to the Shabine. It's called Vision Barbecue. 
Friday is the grand opening. Um, I'm getting multiple messages sent to me. KJ, thank you for sending that to me as well. The mayor is watching today's show, and she posted during the show a Facebook post in response to my commentary in the first 30 minutes of the show. Judah, do you have a screenshot of her post that you can get on screen? It is on screen now. Look at the screen. Look at the screen. For those that are listening on Spotify, iTunes, or Apple Podcasts, the post reads from the mayor, I know that my Facebook Live was long and you have some clarifying questions. Please post your questions and I'll answer them publicly. That's a really good start right there, um, Mayor, because it was a long and discombobulated monologue from you on Super Bowl Sunday that, frankly speaking, has convoluted and clouded the waters, um, as opposed to help or, um, or um, show the community the right direction to go as a leader. There's a couple of other questions that I ask of you, and Alex Erpe is going to join us in about four minutes on the program. The first question was this, how much money did the mayor spend illegally on a city-issued credit card? That's the first question the Daily Progress, the Richmond Times Dispatch, or the Washington Post should ask. The second question is this. If this started in 2018, how did no one else in City Hall know about this? The third question the Washington Post, Richmond Times Dispatch, and Daily Progress should ask. If this has been going on since 2018, and if other people knew about this, what happens to those that are in the know from a culpability, ramifications, or punishment standpoint? The fourth question, what is Joe Plantania's role as the Commonwealth's Attorney of Charlottesville? The fifth question, Joe Plantania is running for re-election for Commonwealth's Attorney of the City of Charlottesville. Does the fact that he's running for re-election and it's a campaign year, does it influence his decision making on whether or not to bring charges on the mayor of Charlottesville? Because it could create a PR nightmare. The sixth question you should ask as a journalist when putting a Sunday expose together that has um, a, a sidebar on the jump inside and some infographics is what I'm envisioning Aaron and Jenny over at the newspaper. I want, it should be above the fold, above the fold with a jump inside, a sidebar story on the jump and two or three infographics to help explain the situation. The next question, newspapers, should be asking is, what do Councillor Heather Hill, Councillor Lloyd Snook, Councillor Cena McGill, and Councillor Michael Payne, what should they do next? Should they um, vote four to one, the mayor's not gonna vote in favor of them, to quote unquote muzzle the mayor, meaning she can't speak anymore from a representation of council or council business. She's airing their dirty laundry. Should they, choose to vote to strip the mayor of the mayor's title, and then the title goes to Cena McGill. Three, do they vote the mayor off the island altogether? Because they, the, they have the ability to do that. And certainly if illegal activity is done by a counselor, other counselors can vote the illegal activity counselor off the island. So there's a lot that council can do. I have a couple of other sound bites that you need to hear before I get to Alex Erpe. Um, how about the second one from the mayor on how they take black politicians out, Judah? Do you have that sound ready to go? That's the first one from today? Yeah, how they take black politicians out is, is how I asked you to save it. Do you have that one ready to go? Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is the mayor from her Facebook Live on Sunday, a two-hour discombobulated jaw on the table while watching this train wreck, I can't believe this is happening, I can't look away monologue. So she's talking about how they take black, how they take black politicians out and this sound bite. If you could, Judah, three, two, one. So I started this conversation to tell you that um, about the fact that um, usually one of the three ways they take black politicians out, um, misuse of funds, misappropriation of funds. I just read an article um, where they were saying Maxine Waters keeps giving her daughter money um, from her campaign. I'm sure her daughter's probably working, but you know, people only read the headlines. Um, 
they keep voting for her. So apparently the majority of her voters appreciate whatever her daughter is doing to help her keep getting elected and she keeps paying her. Um, the next thing they do to take you out is hoping that um, there's some kind of sex scandal um, and that that'll destroy you. And then usually the third thing is um, drugs, right? Um, so those are usually the top three. Then anything related, if you're black, domestic, and I'm saying if you're black, because you know, white people have misused funds, um, sex and drugs, and they still somehow maintain their positions um, a lot of the times. But anyway, um, so in this case for me, it's this um, four page memo and then a memo from December about how um, there's a potential audit issue for the city and a potential civil or criminal liability for individual counselor. That individual counselor is me. <laughs> um, that this was brought to her attention by people I have to turn my receipts into and have checked my receipts and these, this is a thing that I've been doing since 2018. All right, the second clip I needed, uh, I needed you guys to play. I needed you guys to hear. Um, I got two more to play for you. One of them's on the mayor and her take on Chief Brackney and the advice she's giving the police chief of Charlottesville, Virginia. And the, the, the final soundbite, which I'm going to play now here before the interview with Alex Erpy. Alex Erpy is going to join us. Alex and his father, Xavier, um, of Emergent Financial Services, they host a show on this network on Thursday mornings at 10, 15 a.m. It's called Today e Manana. And their show shines a spotlight on the Hispanic and Latino community in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Tomorrow, they have Fernando Furcuts Garay on the program from House of Cuts one of the most talented entrepreneurs in Central Virginia. He's gonna join him on tomorrow's show. I'm gonna to get to Alex in about two minutes. Before I do, I have two more sound clubs to play. I'm gonna play one before Alex, and then the second one I'll save for the end of the show. The clip I'd like for you to play now, and you know what, why don't I do this? I'm gonna save the clips. I want you to hear Alex Erpy and what his plan is for tomorrow's show. And after the interview with Alex Erpy, I'm going to play two clips from Mayor Nakia Walker. The first clip is her take on Police Chief Brackney and the advice she's giving Police Chief Brackney. And the second clip I'm going to play is the mayor giving perspective on how close she was to quit quitting the mayor of Charlottesville, how close she was to quitting. I'm going to get to Alex Erpy now because Alex has. A phenomenal show, and he's got a tremendous guest in Fernando Garay, Fur Cuts, House of Cuts, on the show tomorrow. Judah, we have Alex on the line. Um, good afternoon, Alex. So, I'm doing well, my friend. You, you, you cornered one of Charlottesville's most talented entrepreneurs and local celebrities, and Fernando to come on today, Imanana. This guy is so busy, whether he's, he's the owner of um, House of Cuts whether this guy is hosting a, a, a talks about investment at his barbershop, whether this guy is training or offering perspective on barbering to other future barbers, whether this guy is being a father, a girlfriend, or a proud Charlottesville citizen, he's A-plus people, and he's on today, manana, on Thursday at 10, 15 a.m. He is indeed. No, it's, it's going to be incredible to have him on because he's – I've known him for years, and it's amazing just to see – because his so his grandmother Olga Morse is the founder of Forward Adelante, originally the premier networking Latino networking group here in Charlottesville and in Central Virginia, um, and just the entrepreneurship that flows through that family has been incredible. Just to see his journey and how because he was already becoming huge when he was still at his image That's right. barbershop under his mentor Will Jones, who won the the diversity award at the uh, Chamber of Commerce. I think this was. Vanguard Award, I should say, two years ago, pre-pandemic, and mentioned Fernando in his acceptance speech. And then just to see, at I remember it was just beginning 2019, he starts that his own place on the corner, and I was just like, wow. Right, this is right. Incredible. 
And, and dude, I will straight up say this. In 2019, when he picked the corner as the location, I was unsure because so much of the clientele is tied to students. But in retrospect, the dude picks a phenomenal location. He's genius. He was genius because he gets the students into House of Cuts and the basketball team and football team that serve essentially as evangelists for the business throughout the student community. We already knew the locals were going to come because of the talent that's in that shop. For him exactly. to tap the student population was freaking brilliant. Huge. I mean, he, he basically went nationwide at that point. I'll never forget seeing, because I, I would read, I would always read UVA news that year because we were on our way to the national championship, thankfully. But then, I, and then sometimes because I'm originally from New York, I, I read the New York Post every once in a while. So I'm checking the New York Post and I'm seeing the guy who does, Kyle Guy, the most famous man bun in all of uh, college basketball. And I clicked this. I said, oh, uh, well, I'm curious who this is. And I'm seeing Fernando Duran. I'm like, I know this guy. Yeah. Yeah. And just the nation really got to, uh, to see a chance of his, a uh, look at his talent. I mean, he's cutting basketball players in the NBA, I mean, we're talking Kyle, Ty, DeAndre. He's cutting football players in the National Football League. He's keeping the, the grounds at the university looking fresh as well. What makes him a successful entrepreneur? Uh, to me, I, I think it's the trouble that I mean, he clearly has the dedication to his craft and the passion for it. You don't get to where he is without, I think, you just see it, the way he talks about it. Cause we, we, I interviewed him, I think it was... La two years ago for Fort Adelante uh, newsletter magazine and just when you talk to him it comes out the passion that he has for what he does the fact that he legitimately loves his clients I'm talking like not just like these are people that come in and I service them he like legitimately loves to get to know his clients he loves servicing them he and he's always thinking business when I talked with him you know because I would talk a little bit in investment with him, just what what are his thoughts on, on things. I remember when I interviewed him and he was just starting the shop, just how much thought he had put into, okay, here's how much it's going to cost me to be on the corner. Here's here's my other options. Here's what I should consider. Do I move out of his image? Do I do this? And just, I'm like, this guy has it all planned out and thinking of how do I have the long-term picture of my business and my craft and my persona, his brand. You know, and he's done, I would say he's probably done one of the best jobs I've ever seen of really, he is the brand. He's built an in incredible sense. personal brand. Mm -hmm, exactly. That you say his name, you know exactly who he is, you know exactly what he stands for, you know exactly what he does. And just by saying his name, you don't have to sit there and figure out, oh, oh which, what does he do? That you know instantly. When you hear him, because he is, he and the brand are really almost like one, in a, in a sense, in, in how he brands himself. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Fernando Furcuts Garay on today, Imanana tomorrow at 1015. How has fatherhood changed his perspective? A newly minted father, Fernando Garay. It'll, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm interested to talk with him a little bit about that also, just to see what his, his perspective is. We were obviously, we were all super excited I can't wait. See it. I can't see wait. It happen. I can't wait just to see. Because, I mean, I think he's going to be great because I think he can speak on so many subjects. He can talk about his business, but I'm gonna, we're going to talk to him a little bit about that. We're going to talk to him a little bit about his thoughts on how he sees investing and thinking about the future. I mean, he was putting posts on Facebook, I think, uh, just a little while ago about how he's already, he was already thinking life insurance once he got his first, once his son was born. And I'm saying, how many... I mean, I, there's probably not too many fathers out there that within weeks of your child being born are like, okay, life insurance time. I need to be thinking about how to manage risk for my family, knowing that it relies on what I do as a living. And so just always, I, I'm just going to be so interested to see his perspective on how he thinks about these, these different ways to think about the future, even while he's building his brand today. I cannot wait. What time for him tomorrow? So he's going to be on around 10.30, 10.40. Okay. Ish. Well, my dad and I will have our little intro conversation. We'll talk, we'll talk what's in the news and investing. We'll talk a little bit about risk management, entrepreneurship. And then at the end of the show, too, in Spanish, 
we're going to have some resources um, that just a lot of friend of the program, uh, Johnny Ornelas, yeah. he sent us some information. There's just a lot of information coming out now about more resources for um, entrepreneurs in terms of if you have a restaurant, if you have, if you're, if you struggled a lot in 2020, there's things that the IRS has come out with new news on there for how to help. Um, with that, Johnny Ornelas has been great about sending us some of that information. So we'll share some of that. Um, in Spanish also, to really see if we can get Latino entrepreneurs to be able to access some of the same assistance, the same resources that have really been going out there in the last six to nine months. That's fantastic. So John, Johnny watches your show. So he reached out to you and said, we should share this with everybody? He did. He's a, he, had, he had received some information. He's a, he's a restaurateur himself. He'd received some information and he sent it on to us. And so I'm going to share it. And uh, I was able to do some further research on it on the on the IRS website, which is where I spend a lot of my time, surprise, surprise, when you're in financial services. Um, and so we'll translate it up and, and get it out there. Fantastic. Today, 10, 15 a.m. tomorrow, Alex and Xavier today, Imanana, presented by Emergent Financial Services, a trusted name in the game, Emergent Financial Services. We will see you manana, amigo. I am, I am very much looking forward to this one. Same here. Same here. I'm really excited. You have a good one. You too. Take care. Hasta luego, Alex. Hasta luego. Um, watch tomorrow's show. Watch tomorrow's show. Fernando Furcutz Corre, one of the best entrepreneurs we have in this community. One of the best. Young. I'm talking early 20s a type of entrepreneur. Recent father. Leader in the Latino community. Heck, leader in the Charlottesville and Central Virginia community. Big time show tomorrow. Two more clips to play as promised. Emails coming in, including from the burner account from yesterday. Um, I'm going to have to get to this email in a little bit here. I don't want to read this here in live, live form. I'm not going to read this in live form in these attachments and respond. Um, I'll be back to this. Uh, this email we'll, we'll relay on tomorrow's show after I vetted this, guys, after I vetted this, because it is, it is your burner account here. Um, I got two more clips I need to play, though, J-Dubs. This clip, next one I'm going to play is going to be on Chief Brackney and the advice the mayor is giving to Police Chief Brackney on how to survive Charlottesville, Virginia. The final clip is going to be the mayor on the fact that she's ready to quit city council and how close she was to quitting. First clip, do you have Brackney ready to go, J-Dubs? I think we should go down the road of Brackney. Uh, I'll get to your comments. If you have comments here, I see the comments. We'll get them in the stream, and we'll get them on air. Let's get to Brackney first. Cue it up in three, two, and one. It's just me, because at this point, I'm encouraging Chief Brackney. Save yourself, black woman. Do not deal with these stress, stressors from this community. You and your family deserve for you to be here. You do not deserve for this dis-ease to be created in your body to lead to disease from you trying to figure out um, how to shift this community. That's what I say to her. That's what I think of her when I'm trying to be clear. No one should have to put up with this. And they shouldn't. It's, it's, I'm just, I, I was astonished while watching a nearly two hour discombobulated diatrop. I was, I was, I was mouth agape and I watched a large percentage of it again yesterday just to really make sure I was hearing what I heard the first time. And yesterday while I watched it again, I was literally a, shh, like, it's, it's, it's the, the nearly two hour discombobulated diatribe from Super Bowl Sunday and the mayor's Facebook page is the train wreck or car accident that you can't take your eyes off of. That's the best description of it the train wreck or car accident that you can't stop watching. To further prove that point, 
listen to this sound bite. I was ready to quit. Do you have that ready to go, J-Dubs? Three, two, one. So, a few weeks ago, I was ready to pack it up. I don't care what anybody would have wrote about me. I'll be the first independent black woman mayor elected, and I will also be the first person to ever quit council, and I was 100% okay with that. And I called the Edwards maybe four times, Mr. Edwards three times, and then I end up talking to Shelby once because um, I just wanted permission. You know how that is. And I, in those moments, I really had already made up my mind, so I just wanted them to say it so I wouldn't, you know, feel even a little bit bad about it. I'm like, I know I need to do this for me. Like, this place is sick. I don't want to be a part of that. And now I got to figure out who my people are that can protect me um, because it's nobody here. Can't make this stuff up, man. You cannot make this stuff. It is a Hollywood script here at City Hall. You cannot make this stuff up. I'm going to close the show by recapping the formula for success for a well-executed centerpiece story in the Sunday edition of any newspaper. Why it goes in the Sunday edition is because readership is at, a, is at a higher level on Sunday than any other day of the week because of the coupon inserts that come into the newspaper. People look for those coupon inserts that come on Sunday, and because of those coupons, people are statistically more likely to read content in a print newspaper on Sundays than any other day of the week. So a Sunday centerpiece expose, the story should be above the fold. It should be five or six words in a headline. It should be a single deck headline. I would think that you're gonna want either Tyler or Catherine to write this story for you, Aaron. I'm thinking the primary piece is 25 to 30 inches. You should reach out to the mayor. She will not give you a quote. You should reach out to Brian Wheeler. He will not give you a quote. You should reach out to Joe Plantania. He will give you um, a very general quote with nothing specifics. You should then source the video for quotes that you can use for the story. On the jump page inside the A section, where roughly 16 to 20 inches of the content will jump to, I wanna see an infographic or two, maybe a timeline of events of the legal activity, and I'd also like to see Aaron Richardson, a, a sidebar story from another reporter over what's happening. Here are the questions you should be asking. How much money has the mayor spent illegally on the credit card from 2018 until now? What is the total spent? We deserve to know that as citizens. We deserve to know that as taxpayers. The second question you should be asking, if this started in 2018, how did nobody in City Hall know about this? The next question you should be asking, the fourth one, if this started in 2018 and other people in City Hall knew about this, should they face ramifications, punishment, or worse? The fifth question you should be asking is, what is Joe Plantania's take as Commonwealth's Attorney of Charlottesville on this? Will he, will he press charges? The sixth question you have to ask is, Joe Plantania is running for re-election. Does the Commonwealth's Attorney choose not to pursue charges against the Mayor of Charlottesville because he wants to win a spot on Commonwealth's Attorney for the City of Charlottesville? He's at a crossroads right now, and that crossroads is a character and integrity crossroads. On one left of the crossroad is the path of doing the job to the letter of the law. And illegal use of credit cards, there's a letter of the law for that and what you do. The other path is, does the decision making get swayed because it's a re-election year? And you, you, don't wanna, you don't want a PR firestorm because you know the mayor has followers and you need votes to stay in office and to keep your paycheck. The next questions you should be asking if you're covering this story from a print standpoint, how is city council going to respond to this? Do councilors Hill, Snook, McGill, and Payne choose to vote in a four-block unison and muzzle the mayor and keep her from talking anymore? They can do that. Do they choose to strip the mayor of her mayor title? They can do that. Or better yet, do they see fit that the mayor should be voted off council? Remember, in that discombobulated diatribe from Super Bowl Sunday, 
The mayor threw Cena McGill under the bus. Pretty much called Cena McGill a racist. So now she has lost the popular vote. That was Hill. Now it's Hill, McGill, and S Hill, McGill, and Snook that control the five-person council. Before you had a Walker, McGill, and Payne three-horse race controlling. Now that Walker has made the strategic error of calling McGill a racist, that relationship is splintered, and McGill, Hill, and Snook have the power. That's the show. One of the most dynamic stories I have seen in a very long time is playing out right here in an election year in Charlottesville, Virginia. Five people at the center of this dynamic story. We will wait and see how these five counselors and how the supporting cast, Joe Plantania, Commonwealth attorney, Chip Boyles, city manager, supporting staff, media that covers it, how it continues to play out. Guys, this is the tip of the iceberg. Get ready for a roller coaster ride as we get to November 3rd in election year. My name is Jerry Miller. This is the I Love Seville show on the I Love Seville network. Thank you kindly for joining us.